So all through grade school, junior high, high school, um, I hated history. I, I really did, which was strange because I really loved school. I was, I was one of those kids. Um, but even at a pretty early age, I was heavily focused on the future. I, I, I loved the idea of it. I was definitely into um, technology and gadgets and stuff, and that was all going to get better in the future, right? Um, also, the future was where I was going to live and exist. And I had the chance, in theory, to help improve it, make it better, make that awesome future that I could picture. And history, not so much. With all of my other subjects in school, my teachers did a good job at explaining to me why those were important to me in order to help me create that future that I wanted, you know, math and science and grammar and all that. But for history, they always fell back on this saying that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I thought that was a terrible saying because it, <laughs> first it was, it, 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 it never really inspired me to love history for sure, but also it was so focused on just avoiding the bad and I, I really wanted to help create the awesome. Like that's, that's what I was focused on. But sometime soon after high school, as I became a young adult, my perspective changed dramatically on history. Um, and it happened as I began to realize that history really could help me create that future that I wanted. It, it was actually really important for doing that. Um, I'm a bit of an information addict, admittedly, um, and so to me, what I realized is that history gave me the data points that I needed to better understand the present and what was happening and use that information to make decisions about and help create that future. So before we can talk about the future and what, what that might mean uh, and why the, the open web is so integral to that, this kid that hated history and begrudged every one of my history teachers wants to give you a short, quick history lesson first. Um, just going to jump back to 1991 to begin with. Um, 1991 was an important year to everyone here, whether you realize it or not. Um, for, for those of us that use the internet to make our living or pursue our passions or uh, have our, our voices be heard, 1991 is, is really the year that the internet, as we know it, kind of came to be. Um, there was a, a group called the Commercial Internet Exchange that in the, the late 80s and, and in 90 and 91 was working to take all these siloed networks of, of information where there were these vast wealths of information at universities and some governmental agencies and they wanted to interconnect all these networks and create the internet um, because they wanted all that information to be shareable. They were doing something a little controversial at the time. They wanted everyone to agree to a no settlement policy, uh, which essentially meant that once these were all connected, they wanted to make sure that that information actually flowed freely rather than turning from physical silos into digital silos where you still had to say subscribe to each or pay for each. They wanted it to have this free flow of information and they succeeded. Um, and, and that's kind of what we still see as the structure of the internet. And in 1990, um, Tim Berners-Lee and association with CERN was developing some of the stuff that we use to interact with the internet. They developed the hypertext transfer protocol, or HTTP, the hypertext markup language, or HTML, and the first ever web browser. And all of those were released in 1991, and the young internet was born, and it looked something like this. Not exactly the, the flashy thing that we've kind of come to expect, but you know, we can, we can see our, our roots here, right? The important thing to remember from, from this, for our purposes though, it's not the, the people or the groups that made it all happen, although I'm, I'm thankful to them. Uh, it's not the technologies that, that came to be, although we still use most of them. But it was how 
open the internet was at its very beginning. Those uh, standards that were released were open standards. HTTP and HTML that we still use, those were open standards that anyone could implement. And thanks to the no settlement policy that the commercial internet exchange had pushed for, information flowed freely all over the web. And it was actually focused on sharing information. Like that was its main purpose. And seeing that that's where it started, we'll be able to, to better understand how it's changed over time as we look at where we are now and where we might be going in the future. But before we leave 1991, that was kind of an important part of my story as well. This wasn't a, a it was, as I look back on my life, this is the year that really kind of put me on the path that ultimately brought me here, that uh, took me into programming and open source and ultimately advocating for open source like I'm doing now. Um, I was only nine at the time, so going into fourth grade, so it might seem strange to say that like the direction of my life was set at nine years old, uh, but it's okay that that sounds crazy because nine-year-old me didn't really understand what was happening at the time either. Um, as a matter of fact, if you could travel back in time and ask nine-year-old me what was so awesome about 1991, I'd probably talk to you forever about this. <laughs> I, the Super Nintendo was amazing, so much better than the original Nintendo. The, uh, the, the capabilities, the, the gameplay became so much smoother because it, was, it had uh, so much more power in it, and, uh, and the graphics. I mean, look at these graphics, right? They're amazing. Who recognizes the game? <laughs> Super Mario World, right? Dramatically better graphics than the Super Mario Brothers of the original Nintendo. Um, and, and even though I'd have talked on and on probably about this, because I definitely played a lot of Super Nintendo at that age, um, it wasn't Super Nintendo or those video games that set me down this path, but it was a video game. It was this one. Now, who recognizes this one? Yeah, we have like three people, four. Uh, this is called Gorillas. It was distributed in 1991 uh, with MS-DOS 5, so we're like pre-Windows here when it first came out. And as you can see, the graphics are terrible. But the gameplay, yeah, no, that was really terrible too. It was really terrible. But I played a lot of this game too. Why would I have played so much of this game when I had the Super Nintendo in all its glory, right? It was because of this. See, Gorillas wasn't distributed to showcase what computers were capable of as far as gameplay or graphics. It was actually distributed to showcase QBasic, which was Microsoft's uh, integrated development environment for the basic programming language. So it was distributed as source code. It was open source. And it was really my first taste of openness like this in technology at all. It was kind of my first peek under the hood at how these pieces of technology that I loved were made. Um, I was fascinated by it. I would, the way that you ran it, you would open the development environment, you would open the source file, You'd hit Shift F5, which was the shortcut keys to compile and run the game, and you would play it. Every time I would open and see all this text, I'd scroll down just fascinated that somehow these words that I didn't understand turned into this game. Mediocre as it may be, that fascinated me. And soon that fascination turned into curiosity, and instead of just looking at it, I began to tweak with it and try to make some changes. And Shift F5, and of course it would break because I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> but given time, I slowly began to learn to program in this way. And uh, eventually, I made dramatically modified versions of this game that me and my friends would play. Um, and it's really how I learned to program. Nine-year-old me was not capable of writing this game. I didn't know the, the language. It wasn't easy to learn programming languages without, without some sort of sample like this. I would have had no way to do that. You couldn't just Google it and watch a tutorial, right? Um, so instead, I was able to take
take what someone else had built, these Microsoft developers that had, had built this amazing thing, and I was able to learn from that and kind of pick up from there and build on top of it. And that, that concept of learning from what those before us have done and building on top of it is really how humans have made progress forward through all of history. It's certainly not a concept that I came up with at, at nine years old, right? It dates back at least to the 12th century, early 1100s. Yeah, you thought my history lesson was only going to go back to the 90s because internet, right? Um, Bernard Chartres, a philosopher, a, a teacher at the time, is, is recorded as, as teaching his students and saying that, that we, the moderns, we're not better than the, the ancient philosophers just because we can see and understand more. Instead, he would say that we're like dwarves perched on the shoulders of giants. Right? We're, we're, we're seeing further because we're standing on their shoulders. And if you've heard that saying, roughly, um, but you have no idea who Bernard of Chartres is, it's probably because you learned it like I did uh, from Isaac Newton, some 500 years later, who penned the same in a letter to another scientist, Robert Hooke, saying, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And we look at someone like Isaac Newton, and we see them as a, a bit of a giant. I mean, he gave us Newtonian mechanics, so we understand how planets move. He gave us calculus, as much as you may have hated that class in school, like before him, no calculus, after him, calculus. And we use that for everything that we consider modern. Skyscrapers and jet engines, they, they function, they, they stand, they fly, because we use calculus to help make sure that they do. Um, but he was saying that he's not a giant, he was just able to stand on their shoulders. He was able to build on the progress of those that came before him. And historically, we see these big blips in our progress forward, in, in our understanding, in our invention, every time we get better at sharing information around. When, when there was uh, the, the first consistent language, written language, we see a jump. Uh, when we started writing on paper and could store that in libraries, we see a jump. When the printing press came out, we see a big jump as that information was disseminated all over the place. As a matter of fact, that's the time that Isaac Newton was born into. It's amazing what he was able to do by being able to access the information of those that came before him. But we've gotten better still. We developed computers and were able to digitize all that information and we shrunk those down until we could set them on our desk and then carry them with us and now keep them in our pocket. And we developed the internet just a few decades ago. And it has let us distribute that digitized information much as the printing press let us distribute paper. And the internet is the single most efficient information sharing tool that has ever existed, ever. Like, the, the potential that that has for helping all of us as people move forward and make progress and do amazing things is mind-blowing. I mean, just in the last 28 years that it's been around, look at how far we've come in technology and in, in medicine and our understanding of our, our bodies and our solar system. And in that way, like, the state of the Internet, it's, it's strong. Like, it's amazing. It's so... It has so much potential, and it's so powerful. And the future is bright. Like, the, the chance that it has to improve life for everyone is awesome. And I guess since it's the internet, right? Yes. But if I just talked about how great it is, and how the future could look amazing, for us using it, and I didn't talk at all about the risks that it faces, I feel like I would be being irresponsible. So I do think that there are some dangers that are posed to the internet, to this awesome tool that we have for sharing information and this thing that we probably many of us use to make our living. Who makes your living tied to the internet in some way? Yeah, I mean, this is one of those conferences, right? <laughs> I think that the biggest um, threat that the internet faces is closed systems. Right? When, I, when I say closed systems, what I mean 
are these systems and tools that we use, that we build on, that we rely on, that are owned and controlled by other people or companies, right? So things like um, Twitter and Facebook, right? We use those constantly, but we don't really control them. We just get to use them. We can um, build on top of them. We may rely on them to different degrees, whether it's to keep in touch with family or whether it's to market to customers that we may not otherwise be able to reach. But they're not ours. We don't, we don't own that space at all. We just get to use it so long as what we're using it for aligns with what that company wants us to use it for. They're not bad. They're not inherently evil in any way. As a matter of fact, they can be extremely useful, but they control a thing that we rely on. And that's dangerous. And it's not just these social networks, it's also uh, in website building, you're looking at, at things like Wix and Weebly and Squarespace and in the e-commerce space, we have Shopify and even search engines like Google exert an awful lot of control over what we can and can't do. We don't talk about, oh, I need to learn a thing, I should go research it online. We say, I'm gonna go Google it. It's become synonymous with learning a thing. The problem is, as I talk about these closed systems and the risks um, to people that, like us that work with the internet every single day, it seems like we're all so close to it that it can be hard to actually see the root of the problem. We, we tend to be on the internet every single day, we can see some things that bother us. This company did this and that's not good. Or, or they changed this tool or the terms of service and now I can't use it for what I was using it for before and I have to find something else and that's bothersome. But those are like the trees and it's hard to see the forest because we're so close. So I want to step back from the internet and talk about a, a different um, industry that's walked along this same kind of path, starting out very open and as their tools improved and they got some, some closed versions of those tools, it was improving their lives, it was making it better, it was kind of in the state that we're in now in the internet, um, where there are all these great tools that are improving our lives, but they crossed another line where it went from just using those tools to improve their lives to relying on those tools for their livelihoods and not having alternatives, and it completely changed the dynamic. I want to talk about farming. A long time ago, lots of people farmed. Lots and lots of people, right? Because we weren't particularly good at it. But as we got better at it, less people had to. And we started developing better and better tools for it, whether it was you know, better metals, starting to, to develop the, the plow, um, those kinds of things. And we got better and better and better at it until we started going through things like an industrial road and getting things like tractors, and that dramatically changed the face of farming. Far fewer people needed to farm. Other people could go off and do other things, which I actually think is great. That's progress forward, right? Some of those people that maybe didn't have to farm because tractors made us better at it, and maybe one of those went on to invent, invent the computer. I have no idea. Um, but allowing people to do other things is, is great. And Farmers' lives got better because of tractors, right? The following a plow behind horses or oxen, that doesn't sound near as good as sitting on a tractor and driving up and down your, your field, right? And as we hit the technological revolution, those tractors improved, much like our cars on the road have improved. They, they started getting smarter, and now we have these, these tractors like this, um, that are quite honestly modern marvels of engineering. You get in a tractor like this, and first of all, that farmer's life is way better because that's an air-conditioned cab that they're sitting in, right? Like, that's got to be good. Now, don't get me wrong, farming is, is still uh, extremely strenuous physical labor, but being able to get in an air-conditioned cab when you're doing tractor work, like, that's, that's an improvement on life, right? 
when you get in that tractor, it doesn't use a key to start. It has a tablet inside it, and you tap it, and it wakes up, and you tap the start button, start icon, I guess, um, and it starts up, and you can say, I want to level my field. And it maybe has GPS coordinates for your field already programmed in it. Um, you probably have a reflector set up so that it can laser level your field for you, automatically adjusting the blades to cut it perfectly level. And that's not just cool to have a level field, that makes farmers better at what they do. That field will yield more because as they flood it with water, every plant gets the same amount. Like this has improved their lives dramatically. It's made them um, more efficient. It's, it's made them more profitable and it has made their lives um, more enjoyable. Now sure, when you first get in this tractor once you've bought it and you tap that screen, you're tapping through some terms of services and I agree and blah, 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 and something about only licensing the software but owning the tractor, right? But we all do the same thing on our phones and none of us really read any of that. Um, and it didn't matter because the software was so great. It, again, it was improving their lives dramatically, much like these tools that I've talked about are improving our lives. Like, uh, Facebook lets me talk to people that I wouldn't otherwise get to talk to. And uh, you know, some of these other tools that us build sites and, and e-commerce sites that we could never do before. But at some point, you could no longer run an effective modern farm with anything but these tractors. And that's when things started to get a little bit more difficult for farmers. Um, tractor would break down, but you could only take it to an authorized service center. You couldn't fix it yourself. Not because they weren't capable of it, but because if you changed out a part on the tractor, the computer would say, I don't recognize the serial number on that part, and it would just shut it down and say, contact an authorized representative to come fix this problem. Without the computer functioning, you know what this tractor is good for? Nothing. It's like a paperweight, because, <laughs> really big paperweight, I guess, but um, it, it can't even start. You can't even start it up and move it somewhere else. And maybe it was just, you know, the GPS dish that wasn't working. And before, at least you could drive it around. But once you switched it out, you couldn't anymore until you got an authorized rep out there. And if you took it to an authorized service center, you paid what they said you needed to pay because the alternative was just another authorized center, which were, by the way, all controlled by the tractor company. Um, and you waited however long they said you needed to wait. But the problem with that is farming is time sensitive, right? Sometimes you have to harvest within the next week or you'll lose your crop. And they're saying it's going to be three weeks till they can get your tractor back to you. And some farms actually went bankrupt because of this. They, they couldn't make it. But other farmers, as people often do when they feel backed into a corner, they got really creative and started trying to fix their tractors anyway, you know? I couldn't just swap out the GPS dish for, with this other tractor that I don't need now, but maybe I can break into the computer and make it recognize it. And that started by having to custom make cables that would work with these proprietary jacks on the computers. And once they did that, they couldn't get into the software, so they, they hired hackers and started working with this group of hackers to crack through the protection layers in the software because they, it affected their ability to make their living. And pretty soon, farmers were trading around cracked versions of tractor operating systems so that they didn't go bankrupt. That's crazy. <coughs> that that's where they ended up. But also, as it turns out, like that's, that's against the terms of service of the software that they're using. They're, <laughs> they're technically breaking the law to do that, and they thought, that's wrong. Me fixing my own tractor shouldn't be breaking the law. So they started to lobby for right to repair legislation. 
It says, hey, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, some of the expensive tractors, maybe even a million dollars on a tractor. I bought that. I own that. If it breaks and I want to fix it or I want to have my local repair shop fix it, I should be able to. And they started trying to push this through a handful of states, and then it was a dozen states, and now it's like half the states. It's been several years that this has been going on. And I don't want to dig too much into that legislation because I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a lawmaker, but do you know how many states have successfully passed right to repair legislation so far? None. Because big companies like John Deere and Apple, they don't want that. They want to be able to require you to go to an authorized service center. And thankfully, the internet and the closed systems that we're looking at on there, we're not to that point yet, right? We, we started with the open and we've gotten to some of the closed. It's kind of improved our lives and we like that. Like I'm all for having a, a better life. But I do worry about whether we might take that next step from using those technologies to improve our lives into relying on them and find ourselves in the same kind of spot that farmers are now. And I think that that is the biggest risk that the internet faces. But it has so much potential, so much possibility. I mean, look at all of us that are making our living off it now. Look at how much progress things like the medical field have made because they've been able to share information better than they ever have before. So we're not there yet. And we can, we can make sure that we never get there. As I talk about the future and the internet, I always think it's really important to say that the internet isn't the future. The internet is right now. Like we have this thing right now. We're, we're using it. Maybe we'll use it in better, different ways in the future, but right now we have this amazing tool. And it's, it's more than just a, a, a money-making system. It's more than just some neat, shiny toy. It's an important tool that all of humanity can benefit from. We have this right now. It's not the future, but it does set us up for a better future. It really does. In its current state, the internet sets us up for a better, more exciting future, for us to all make progress forward, so long as we keep it usable the way that it is now. So what can we do? First, use open platforms, right? We're all here for this WordPress conference. I assume pretty much everybody here uses WordPress in some form or another, yes? Come on. More than that, use WordPress, yeah. There we go, yeah. Um, WordPress is one of those open platforms that I think are extremely important in this case. Um, the thing that brought me to WordPress in the beginning was that it was a tool to solve the need that I had. The thing that has kept me around helping to build WordPress for the last 13 years, I think, is that I think that it offers an important viable alternative to some of these closed platforms. And those viable alternatives, those open viable alternatives, act as checks and balances to make sure that there is always a place for people to turn. Farmers don't have that right now. There isn't an open alternative for their tractors. They can still let them do what they need to do. But we can make sure that those always stay around for the internet by continuing to use and support them. We can all spread the word. Um, I said earlier that I'm a bit of an information addict. That may have been an understatement. Like, uh, I, I am definitely an information addict, and I, I may just think that, uh, I may just like knowing these things because I love knowing all kinds of things, but I really think that if we help other people understand that the internet isn't just this shiny, fun thing, but that it's actually this really important tool for us to make progress forward as people, um, that more people would join in wanting to protect it and, and keep it safe. And lastly, voting with your money, right? Um, 
I mean, this one, it, it maybe seems obvious, but I feel like it's always worth saying. Support the people and the companies that support the open web. Um, help them keep this an open place that we can all use to make our living, that we can all use to make our lives better, but that will continue to function for generations to come. I'm Aaron Campbell. Um, I work for GoDaddy, uh, specifically focusing on ways that GoDaddy can help make WordPress better for everyone as this open, uh, viable option. Uh, I'm obviously extremely passionate about the, the open web and open source as a part of that. And I would love to take any questions if you all have any. Hey, there, are, there are microphones down the middle. Uh, if you don't want to go up to a microphone, I can repeat the question so that people can hear it as long as I can hear it. So, with regard to your openness, um, I'd be remiss to not bring up the policy issues that are involved in the internet, the world that we live in. What are your thoughts on net neutrality and all of the aspects of that that we're um, facing now, and which providers should we be supporting that support net neutrality? Always love getting the net neutrality question. I'm worried that people are going to be coming at me with pitchforks and wires, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> It's um, not speaking to any particular specific piece of legislation because again, I'm not a lawyer and, I, and laws can get super complex. The um, concept of and need, the concept of net neutrality and the need for it, I think are, are both um, very important. Like it's, we need to ensure that this space is protected and available to everyone. I, I want to make sure that it doesn't become a, a pay-to-play area where you can only get your information out to people if you have enough billions in the bank to, to do that. Um, so I think it's extremely important, and I do think that we should all be paying attention to that legislation, um, voting accordingly where we can. Um, it's, it's huge, it, it really is. The, the, I don't even know if I can really put into words how important it is to keep this open for everyone, including legislating that if that's what's necessary. I, I think that there are risks of putting control of the internet in any, in the hands of any smaller group of people, right? We, the internet is the place that the vast majority of people go to learn things. Um, and I don't like the, the idea that any small group of people would have control over what we can and can't learn. Um, so legislating it such that that can't happen, uh, I'm, I'm all in favor. Anyone else? Maybe with one that doesn't make me sweat so bad? <laughs> <laughs> no, really? No one else? All right, well, I'm going to be around all weekend, and I love to talk to, to people about this kind of stuff, so if you want to come up and chat.